American universities are unique in the world in running these multi-million dollar athletic competitions. I mean, if you're a soccer player in Europe, you don't go to a university to play soccer. And if you're a university student who wants to play soccer, you you play with a club team. Yes, the NCAA president has said, yes, let's compensate athletes. A remarkable statement for the leader of this organization that for years has said, oh, we, college athletics is purely amateurism and uh, nothing but. This is Stamp from Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Kim Carlin. Please subscribe or follow this feed on your favorite podcast app. That way you'll have access to all our new episodes as soon as they're available. You know, in sports, there are some sports, particularly Olympic sports, that are a little weird. And one of my favorites is the biathlon, which combines skiing with rifle shooting. And you might say to yourself, how do these two things fit together? It's kind of odd. And it's the, the idea was this was what Scandinavian soldiers did in the 19th century. Our guest today is a little bit of a biathlete as well, because he combines uh, expertise in two areas that are coming together in an interesting way, but that weren't always connected quite as much as they are today. I'm speaking about our colleague, William B. Gould IV. Uh, Bill is a world-renowned labor law scholar and litigator and government servant. He was a former chairman of the National Labor Relations Board, where he played a critical role in bringing the 1994-95 baseball strike to its conclusion. He's also the former chairman of the California Agricultural Relations Board. So he is at the peak of labor law, both the practice and the scholarship. But he's also one of the most sports-minded academics in the legal academy. His sports law class at Stanford, for which he enlisted former Golden State Warriors player and coach Al Adels and being uh, sports writer Leonard Coppett as co-instructors, brought sports greats to campus to speak, including Willie Mays and Dusty Baker. His most recent book is For Labor to Build Upon, Wars, Depressions, and Pandemic which was published by Cambridge University Press in the spring of 2022. We are so glad to have you with us today, Bill. Thank you, Pam. Good to be here with you. So there's been a lot of, obviously, sports in the news and sports law in the news. But one of the things that happened really recently is that on February 5th, the National Labor Relations Board, of which you used to be the chair, approved a union election for members of the Dartmouth College men's basketball team. And, you know, until quite recently, I think we always thought of the students who played sports at a college as amateurs. They were not employees. They were students who just happened to be very tall or very fast or very big. So what what's going on here? Well, you're correct. Actually, the regional director for the NLRB in Boston uh, held that uh, 16 uh, Dartmouth basketball players who petitioned the board to be represented as employees, that uh, their petition could go forward. Uh, this is appealable to the full board in Washington and ultimately to the uh, courts of general jurisdiction and may wind up in the Supreme Court. And uh, the regional director uh, looked at the considerations that we normally uh, a look at in determining who is an employee. Labor law covers employees. The universities have always maintained that uh, their athletes are student athletes and something different from employees. They're horrified by the idea that uh, they could be employees. And the regional director said, well, look at the extent to which uh, uh, these players are actually controlled by an, uh, the uh, university their hours of practice, the classes that uh, may conflict with uh, uh, those hours of practice and the uh, their involvement uh, on travel, uh, rules and regulations, which generally they cannot depart from, are established. And also, the regional director said, even though um, they uh, don't have in the Ivy League scholarships, which uh, provide them uh, money, uh, they are provided various things of worth, of financial worth, tickets and uh, and the like, uh, which which compensate them 
And uh, therefore, you have the two key considerations which uh, lead to their being regarded as employees uh, within the meaning of labor law. So one thing I read um, a while back was that the way that schools started referring to their the students who play on their teams as student athletes was to avoid being held liable for workers' comp for exactly. students who got injured playing sports. Yes, yes, exactly. They, they, uh, that was the origin uh, of it, although uh, it has uh, served as a, a useful rubric in warding off uh, the various uh, challenges to uh, uh, the concept of the various challenges which have said that, no, they may be students, but there's also an employment relationship, mm -hmm. just as the graduate teaching assistants and research uh, uh, people have been regarded as employees as well as uh, students. And of course, we know that students perform a wide variety of functions uh, for the university, which uh, give them employment status. So, so universities are resistant to this. Why? That is, why don't they want to say, yeah, of course, these students are employees in the same way that the students who work in the dining hall are employees or students who reshelf books in the library or in place. Why don't they want these folks to be employees? Well, for two main reasons. One is that uh, they want a uh, hierarchical, to maintain the hierarchical relationship they have with them where uh, these particular individuals uh, don't have any uh, uh, guaranteed input into health and safety, but also and other matters that may affect them, but also money that uh, gradually uh, the uh, players have uh, initially pointed out a, a decade ago that some of the players in very big time uh, uh, university uh, athletics were uh, felt that they didn't have uh, adequate food. They didn't, uh, and gradually that was changed. And uh, uh, they felt that the uh, scholarships really in comparison with uh, the revenues that are coming into universities the large salaries that are being paid to uh, coaches uh, who uh, supervise them and uh, the, the salaries that are being given to university administrators, the new uh, apparatus which uh, supports uh, uh, athletics and colleges, uh, is very much out of whack with their position, even if they get uh, full-time uh, athletic scholarships, which many of them do, not in the Ivy League, not in Dartmouth. So suppose suppose they have the vote and you create a union at Dartmouth. I mean, one of the things that seems hard to imagine here is uh, the turnover, of course, is 100% every four years in the workforce. And when I think about, you know, our, our clinic has represented a number of uh, unions at various points. Um, yeah, and most recently we represented a Teamsters local in a case. And the people who were instrumental inside the union in, in solidarity and running the strikes and the like are people who've been on the job for a long time. What's it going to look like if the Dartmouth basketball team has a union? What what well, what do you think will change? Well, there are two things. One is uh, you put your finger on something that uh, may retard the number of petitions uh, that are filed by uh, people who are unlikely to see the fruits of uh, whatever collective bargaining agreement they're able to negotiate. But you have to keep in mind that this is true of all athletes, professional as well as the so-called amateur ones in universities, uh, in professional sports. Uh, the same kind of resistance took place. They said, oh, these are not really employees. Well, again, the same examination produced the uh, the conclusion that they are employees within the meaning of uh, labor law and their lives are very uh, abbreviated, very short. The uh, In football, uh, the average player is uh, lucky if he can stay on for uh, a year or so, yet we've had collective bargaining now in football and all the major sports for a half a century. And I think that uh, their situation is not fundamentally different from uh, that of athletes in the university. The same is true of uh, of these uh, graduate uh, teaching assistants and research people whom we've seen uh, have obtained uh, recognition and collective bargaining rights in many unions right here at Stanford, 
the uh, union has been certified as a collective bargaining representative. They're going to be here for a uh, relatively short period of time compared to the workers who were being represented in the uh, in the case that uh, you were speaking of that went to the Supreme Court that you were involved in involving the Teamsters and their members. So, yes, there is a very short window uh, for them. Yes, uh, that may uh, diminish the uh, uh, extent to which uh, a lot of people uh, will file petitions like the Dartmouth people did throughout the country. Uh, but uh, that is not fundamentally different, this short uh, period of em the employment relationship than uh, professional athletes who, who all have collective bargaining and graduate students who do as well. That's, that's a super interesting point. Now, if you think about like the baseball players union or the NFL union, it's one union negotiating with the entire panoply of employers. And here, each union would be a separate union. And is it going to be sport by sport at the school? It, it seems odd to me to have 17 different unions for 17 varsity sports. Well, you're talking about uh, two different aspects of this. Uh, I think that um, what the NLRB has traditionally said is that uh, there's no one grouping of employees which is appropriate, which rules out all others. And uh, this issue has arisen countless times in the, uh, uh, in the workforce. So that the, what the regional director said in the Dartmouth case and what the uh, regional director said in an earlier case, which was uh, quite important involving football players at Northwestern, was uh, the... Uh, a unit involving one university can be an appropriate unit, even though there are issues that go beyond the university. There are rules that are devised by the uh, the NCAA, the uh, group that uh, supervises athletics uh, throughout the uh, country. There are rules that are devised by the conferences, which uh, these uh, universities are part of. Uh, some of these issues... Um, may not lend themselves to uh, bargaining at a university level. Some may, the, the varying financial uh, ability to pay by different universities may, uh, may lend itself to collective bargaining at a uni university level. So if uh, they, they're unable to bargain effectively at the university level, well, that's something for them to work out. That's been the traditional view of the uh, NLRB. Now, I think that uh, there are also, as you point out, uh, issues that go beyond uh, one sport. And uh, the, one of them is the, that's most often talked about and cited is uh, the fact that uh, there are women's sports as well as uh, uh, men's sports. So m these petitions thus far have been filed by uh, men. We have a statute called Title IX which obliges uh, universities to treat uh, uh, women and men's sports uh, equally. And uh, the universities have said that, uh, look, uh, if we uh, uh, grant uh, these uh, people uh, whatever they're demanding or some of the things they're demanding, that will put us out of whack with uh, what the uh, women are getting, and that will in turn create Title IX problems for us. Well. I think there are two answers to that. One is that uh, it, this may suggest that the universities could, if the women don't have collective bargaining representation, undertake to uh, uh, provide the women with something comparable in the wake of their negotiations with the men. Or there could be a, a negotiation process which takes into account a wide variety of uh, considerations in athlete, athletics generally throughout the university. Or, if the women so wish, they might uh, petition for representation themselves, and they might petition for uh, representation which would be at the same table uh, with the men. So there are a variety of ways that these uh, legal obligations uh, involving men and women, which is something that comes up quite frequently, can be adhered to. Collective bargaining isn't necessarily inconsistent with Title IX obligations, and it, it, it's not inconsistent. 
Although it's starting to sound, I, I'd agree with you on, on all of this, but it is starting to sound as if intercollegiate sports was not designed with this model in mind at all. And, you know, if you, if you take off your labor law hat for just a moment and think about your sports law hat and the like, there's also been this huge realignment of the conferences recently. There are revenue sports and non-revenue sports. And as you know, I'm spending the winter quarter uh, teaching here in Italy. And American universities are unique in the world in running these multi-million dollar athletic competitions. I mean, if you're a soccer player in Europe, you don't go to a university to play soccer. And if you're a university student who wants to play soccer, you you play with a club team. What do you see as the future of kind of interscholastic sports between the kind of consolidation of the conferences, the role of Title IX, um, and we haven't even talked about the name, in, image, and likeness stuff yet, which you might want to describe to our listeners. Yes. Well, yeah, there are a lot of uh, issues here, and uh, it's quite possible that... Uh, down the road, this could take a very uh, different form that uh, people who want to uh, are serious enough about athletics to move on to the professional level, that something else will emerge w uh, in lieu of uh, the kind of program that we have uh, today. I think that uh, one thing that the NCAA, the NCAA president has said, yes, let's compensate athletes. It's a remarkable statement for the leader of this organization that for years has said, oh, we college athletics is purely amateurism and uh, nothing but. Now you have this uh, former governor of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker, who's the head of the NCAA, say, yeah, let's compensate uh, the athletics. And many of the universities were horrified by this idea. Let's compensate the athletes, but only the Division One schools, the uh, the kind of major league schools that uh, have uh, the big television contracts and the uh, uh, the uh, big revenue that flows from uh, those kinds of things. Can I ask you a question about this, Phil? Oh, which is like, it, once we decide that the, it, 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 let's assume that the NLRP's position gets upheld and compensation is paid to these folks for playing these sports, is there some reason why they need to be enrolled students at that point? The, the, the only thing that requires that they uh, uh, be uh, enrolled uh, students is uh, the current practices of the uh, of the universities. Uh, there, there is uh, look, uh, Pam. The fact of the matter is, if you look at many of the universities that are uh, particularly famous in the big revenue sports, football and basketball, you would be hard put to characterize of these so-called uh, uh, student athletes as students. Uh, well, yeah, in basketball, it's the one and done's, right? I mean, and done. You're, you, you're just there. And are you really are you really there for uh, in terms of uh, classes? You have Oklahoma, which segregates their uh, athletes from the uh, rest of the students. So you, you don't meet the students uh, that you might want to have an interchange with and discuss uh, what happened in a particular class, there's no opportunity to do that. And, uh, you know, the, the cold reality is if you uh, listen to some of the interviews that are conducted with some of the students and the grammar that's uh, used by them, you would be hard put to say that uh, these individuals are uh, are, are students. And the, the student uh, part of the equation is kind of a fig leaf. Uh, which uh, uh, has been uh, uh, exposed, I think, uh, uh, more recently. Uh, look, now Stanford has been, you mentioned realignment. Stanford has become a part of a conference where most of the schools are on the East Coast. So our students are on the airplanes for most of the semester. And, uh, you know, there are all kinds of resolutions which the uh, uh, University Senate is passing saying, that will provide uh, opportunities for them to get their lectures uh, through Zoom wherever they are on the airplanes that will have will have uh, exams uh, provided elsewhere. Already, of course, exams are frequently uh, taken by students elsewhere. And uh, 
the more you're in this kind of uh, box, uh, cut off from the rest of the student body, and I think the more difficult it becomes to uh, identify uh, the so-called student athletes as students. It could go towards uh, a concept where they are athletes uh, and uh, and not students. You mentioned name and likeness uh, and likeness. Name, image, and likeness. Yeah. Yes, NIL is the yeah. uh, acronym. So, so where did that come from? Well, that came about just about at the same time of, as a lot of cases that preceded or, or these some of these labor law cases. Uh, there was a fellow, uh, the mo most famous uh, controversy arose down at uh, Southern California, a fellow who was very a very good uh, basketball player named O'Bannon. And O'Bannon one day found out that uh, Southern California had a, um, a video of uh, him, O'Bannon, playing a game, and they were selling this video to uh, other people, and the university was receiving re revenue. He didn't even know that the video existed, let alone be consulted about it, and let alone, as he said was appropriate, being paid for it. And so you began to have a, an attack uh, uh, on um, uh, the, uh, the university practices uh, in this regard, and the Supreme Court simultaneously using the antitrust law said that the uh, university rules which restrained athletes from uh, getting anything beyond uh, full-time scholarships was uh, could be if uh, there if the uh, uh, benefits were uh, the denial of benefits was in some way related to education itself a violation of the antitrust law and so uh, that was the Alston decision in 2021. So the combination of these cases involving NIL, as well as uh, antitrust cases attacking uh, university rules, in which the court, by the way, said, who's kidding who? There's been money given out to athletes everywhere, from time immemorial, going back to the 19th century. And uh, antitrust laws kick in, and uh, Justice Kavanaugh, a conservative on the court, said uh, uh, this relationship is just like any other employment relationship. A very conservative Supreme Court justice. And you have the LRB simultaneously saying these people are being misclassified. They're employees and not uh, uh, so-called student athletes. So uh, all of these things have kind of led up to this new round of cases uh, where uh, uh, Dartmouth and others have challenged uh, the relationship and said that it's an employment relationship and not a student relationship. So, Bill, one of the things that you just mentioned is, you know, a conservative Supreme Court in the Alston case came out with a very kind of, if you will, pro-worker ruling. And I wonder if you might speculate a little bit on why it is that the court seems to be more sympathetic to student athletes or athlete students or athletes who work at a college than it seems to be to workers generally? Well, I think if we look at the Alston case, which the Supreme Court decided in 2021, where they held that the uh, uh, Sherman Antitrust Act uh, could declare uh, unlawful um, under the Sherman Antitrust Act practices, which uh, uh, restrain uh, athletes from uh, receiving uh, uh, benefits uh, beyond a basic scholarship could be regarded as unlawful. There was a, a feeling that the court expressed that uh, it kind of goes back to this fig leaf co concept that I've uh, uh, alluded to earlier, and that is, who's kidding who? We know that uh, going back to the 19th century, uh, money has played a big role in uh, the sports industry production at the college level. And we know that uh, in some instances under the table, uh, athletes have been given money in the, in the process. So this is a, this is a big business. This is a, uh, an industry uh, that, uh, contrary to what the Supreme Court, uh, what the uh, university said the Supreme Court should do, where antitrust applies. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, 
in a separate concurring opinion, one of the conservative members of the court uh, said, this relationship between athletes and universities is exactly like any other employment relationship. We wouldn't tolerate uh, with a straight face uh, for one second the arguments that are being put forward that uh, uh, the these uh, athletes can't receive uh, compensation in any other industry uh, at all. Uh, so there is a suggestion that the court uh, is going to deal with uh, these cases perhaps differently than they've dealt with the rights of labor uh, in other uh, industry where the court has been, uh, for the most part, uh, this court has been uh, quite anti-worker and anti-union in the process. Now, that said, if I were uh, an employer's lawyer, a university uh, employer's lawyer, I would want to have the Dartmouth case go front and center first because Dartmouth is really uh, small potatoes in the uh, in the world of uh, big time commerce in the uh, yeah I mean I assume that Dartmouth's that Dartmouth's basketball team is not a net revenue producer for the school. Well, that's one of the things that Dartmouth said to the regional director uh, in this case. They said we're not we're not profitable. We lose money. And of course, the regional director said two things to that. One is being profitable doesn't determine the question of whether uh, there's an employment relationship, doesn't resolve that question. And the other thing that the uh, uh, regional director said, uh, you're calculating your profits so as to exclude income that you get from March Madness, that you get from uh, ESPN te television games where you have a share and where you uh, place that not in the basketball program, but in the athletics program also. It's a question of bookkeeping. So the regional director was quite skeptical. Nonetheless, I would rather have an Ivy League school, which has no scholarships, be the case where you can make your case of first impression than uh, a college like uh, Alabama or uh, Clemson in football or Duke in basketball, where uh, it's very hard to to uh, uh, argue against the proposition that this is uh, big business and that uh, these employee these people are really employees. Well, yeah, I mean, I I think you know if you think about Ivy Ivy League athletes, if they want to walk away from their sport, they can walk away at any time. And their aid from the school, the you know, their financial aid is not based on whether they're playing the sport or not. I mean, the sport made up, as you know, from reading books like The Game of Length, the sport may have played a major role in their ability to get into the school in the first place. But once you're in the school as an Ivy League athlete, you walk away at any time. Whereas if you walk away as a football player at, you know, USC or a basketball player at Duke, you give up a scholarship that's worth you know sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year. Yeah, it's a very basic difference between yeah. the and, and 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 one other thing while you were talking, Bill, that it struck me is like it you know the 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 court skepticism in the Alston case and your prediction about their skepticism generally ties in with their skepticism about universities' admissions policies generally. You know, if you think about what they did in the in the SFFA cases, the Harvard and North Carolina cases, this is a court that really doesn't think very highly of higher education institutions as straight players. True, true. I, I think that uh, uh, this court, particularly in the uh, affirmative action arena, has, has expressed that. Although uh, you have a line of decisions, and uh, here I'm thinking of uh, the yeshiva decision in 1980 by the Supreme Court, where the court uh, said, uh, and painting with a very broad brush, that universities, uh, professors, are not uh, employees within the meaning of the act. They are managerial employees, uh, which are impliedly excluded from statutory coverage because they really shape their own employment rela relationship. They participate in it. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the universities took a uh, position on uh, the applicability of the Age Discrimination Act to professors, which I think differed from uh, 
many of the professors without even consulting them. So, so you have true uh, that this court is kind of upset with uh, uh, universities, uh, but on the other hand, you have uh, the fact that uh, other uh, courts have been uh, given a great deal of deference uh, to the universities, particularly where the employment relationship is involved. Again, I, I think that uh, employment labor lawyers who want to promote broad employment status should be concerned about the fact that Dartmouth is going first because uh, a lot of these judges are Ivy League graduates uh, and uh, may not uh, see Dartmouth in quite the same manner as they've been, been accustomed to seeing Clemson or the University of Alabama. Yeah, I said it's interesting to to think about this because you know the two two schools where this has happened so far, Northwestern and then um, Dartmouth, are not your typical big sports schools. I mean, I know Northwestern's in the Big Ten, but as you say, Bill, it will be interesting to see what happens when this goes when this but, goes. Yeah, but the board the board did to the Northwest the Northwestern case the board facing the same kind of findings that the regional director made in the Dartmouth case in the uh, Northwestern case said, oh, sir, allowing the uh, union to be certified without even looking at the employee status issue would not be conducive to good labor management relations because of the fact that uh, some of the members of the conference are public employers and not private employers, and the board uh, doesn't have jurisdiction over public employers. But uh, my board, when I was chairman, uh, held that uh, we could assert jurisdiction over people who did business with the government, even we, though we didn't have jurisdiction over the government. And uh, the employers were saying, hey, look, everything is resolved in the contract uh, between us and the government, and there's nothing that a, a collective bargaining can, can do about uh, the matter of wages, given that resolution over by an agency uh, that uh, you don't even uh, have jurisdiction over. Our view there was the parties can decide for themselves what they can do as a practical matter in, uh, in bargaining relationships. I mean, it, you know, this is so fascinating, Bill, but as in all things connected with sports except baseball, there's a time and the clock has run out on us. And you know this as I'm sure, but Greenfields of the Mind is one of the most beautiful pieces of writing ever done. It's about baseball. So I want to thank our colleague Bill Gould for being with us here today on Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pim Carlin. Thanks for listening. And be sure to subscribe or follow this feed on your favorite podcast app. That way you'll have access to all our new episodes as soon as they're available.